Chapter 4 Well, three or four months run along, and it was well into the winter now. I had been to school most all the time, and could spell and read and write just a little, and could say the multiplication table up to six times seven is thirty-five, and I don't reckon I could ever get any further than that if I was to live forever. I don't take no stock in mathematics anyway. At first I hated the school, but by and by I got so I could stand it. Whenever I got uncommon tired, I played hooky, and the hiding I got next day done me good and cheered me up. So the longer I went to school, the easier it got to be. I was getting sort of used to the widow's ways, too, and they weren't so raspy on me. Living in a house and sleeping in a bed pulled on me pretty tight mostly. But before the cold weather, I used to slide out and sleep in the woods sometimes, and so that was a rest to me. I liked the old ways best, but I was getting, so I liked the new ones, too, a little bit. The widow said I was coming along slow but sure, and doing very satisfactory. She said she weren't ashamed of me. One morning, I happened to turn over the salt cellar at breakfast. I reached for some of it as quick as I could, to throw over my left shoulder and keep off the bad luck. But Miss Watson was in ahead of me, and crossed me off. She says, Take your hands away, Huckleberry, what a mess you are always making. The widow put in a good word for me, but that weren't going to keep off the bad luck. I knowed that well enough. I started out, after breakfast, feeling worried and shaky, and wondering where it was going to fall on me, and what it was going to be. There is ways to keep off some kinds of bad luck, but this wasn't one of them kind, so I never tried to do anything, but just poked along low-spirited and on the watch out. I went down to the front garden and clumb over the stile, where you go through the high board fence. There was an inch of new snow on the ground, and I seen somebody's tracks. They had come up from the quarry and stood around the stile a while, and then went on around the garden fence. It was funny they hadn't come in, after standing around so. I couldn't make it out. It was very curious, somehow. I was going to follow around, but I stooped down to look at the tracks first. I didn't notice anything at first but next I did. There was a cross in the left boot heel made with big nails, to keep off the devil. I was up in a second, and shinning down the hill. I looked over my shoulder every now and then, but I didn't see nobody. I was at Judge Thatcher's as quick as I could get there. He said, Why, my boy, you are all out of breath. Did you come for your interest? No, sir. I says, is there some for me? Oh, yes. A half yearly is in. Last night, over a hundred and fifty dollars. Quite a fortune for you. You had better let me invest it along with your six thousand, because if you take it, you'll spend it. No, sir, I says. I don't want to spend it. I don't want it at all, nor the six thousand, nether. I want you to take it. I want to give it to you the six thousand and all. He looked surprised. He couldn't seem to make it out. He says, Why, what can you mean, my boy? I says, Don't you ask me no questions about it, please. You'll take it, won't you? He says, Well, I'm puzzled. Is something the matter? Please take it, says I, and don't ask me nothing, then I won't have to tell no lies. He studied a while, and then he says, Oh, ho, oh, I think I see. You want to sell all your property to me, not give it. That's the correct idea. Then he wrote something on a paper and read it over and says, There, you see it says, for a consideration. That means I have bought it from you and paid you for it. Here's a dollar for you. Now you sign it. So I signed it and left. Miss Watson's friend, Jim, had a hairball as big as your fist. 
it came from the stomach of an ox, and he could use it to do magic. He said a spirit was inside it, and it knew everything. That night, I went to him and told him my dad was back because I saw his footprints in the snow. I wanted to know what he was going to do and if he was going to stay. Jim took out his hairball and spoke over it. Then he held it up and dropped it on the floor. It only moved a little. Jim tried a few more times, but it was the same every time. Then he listened to it closely, but it didn't speak. He said it needed money to talk. I gave him a fake quarter I had, which looked a bit worn out and greasy. I thought the hairball might not know it was fake. Jim believed he could make the hairball think it was real. He said he would put the quarter in a potato overnight, and by morning, it would look fine. Jim was right. The next morning, the quarter looked good as new. He said the hairball was ready to talk now. He told me it said my dad wasn't sure what to do next. Sometimes he thought about leaving, and other times he thought about staying. The best thing was to wait and see what he decided. The hairball said two angels were watching over him, one white and one black. The white one tried to guide him right, but the black one would mess things up. It wasn't clear which one would win in the end. The hairball also told me about my future, saying I'd face some troubles and joys. I might get hurt or sick sometimes, but I would always get better. It said there would be two women in my life, one rich and one poor, and I would first marry the poor one and then the rich one later. It warned me to stay away from water and be careful because my fate said I might end up in danger. When I went to my room that night, my dad was there, waiting for me.